Uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat and we will answer your questions at the end of the webinar if time permits. If not, we will get those questions, those answers to you after in an email. Uh, welcome to Faith in Place. Faith in Place is Place empowers Illinois people of all faiths to be leaders in caring for the earth, providing resources to educate, connect, and advocate for healthier communities. We believe that when people of faith lead the environmental movement, it is a movement focused on justice and care for our common environment. Faith in Place has several locations, uh, but we work in all of Illinois. Um, our locations are in Chicago, uh, Lake County, North and West suburbs, Urbana-Champaign and Southern Illinois. So here's a poll. We would like to know where you're located. So did we see? Did I, I'm sorry, Katie, did I see the poll? Yeah, here we go. So we have okay. uh, folks from Chicago and folks from the North and West suburbs. Welcome, we're glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you, welcome everyone. Today's presenters are Samantha Miller, that's me, hey, hello. I am a Faith in Place Outreach Support and we have Katie Maxwell, Faith in Place communications coordinator, and Akusawa Gooseby. She's our special guest from Elevate Energy. She's the community organizer there. Awesome. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you. You're welcome, Katie. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking all about finding climate solutions to our crisis. First, we're going to talk about the climate crisis, and then we'll talk through um, a variety of solutions. And I'm excited to have Akosua join us in talking especially about um, energy efficiency solutions. And then we'll wrap up with some ways to connect with Faith in Place and with Elevate. All right, so let's start off by talking about the climate crisis um, and really thinking about what's happening with the science as well. So our climate is kept um, stable by a variety of gases. These are called greenhouse gases. And uh, the most plentiful one in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. It's also the most important um, greenhouse gas because it can last in the atmosphere up to 200 years. Other gases that um, are at play include methane, and methane can last only 12 years in the atmosphere, but it is actually more potent than carbon dioxide. So in some ways, it's a little bit more concerning than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We also have fluorinated gases making up 3% and then nitrous oxide as well. And all of these gases surround the planet like a blanket and keep the, the planet comfortable, help us to um, be able to live. However, when they build up as they have been doing since the start of the industrial revolution by human caused activities, then we see the greenhouse gas effect cause climate change, cause the changes that we're seeing in the atmosphere, the warming and other impacts um, that are not just natural. So there's natural greenhouse effect that keeps us happy and safe. And then there's the added um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, which is contributing to some really scary impacts. So let's talk a little bit more about that CO2 increase. 
We know that CO2 has been increasing in the atmosphere because uh, NOAA has a, a laboratory in Hawaii where they track this. And as of May, we were at 417 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and that's pretty concerning because scientists at the IPCC have stated that 430 parts per million would cause 1.5 degrees increase in, um, in global temperature. And we wanna stay away from that. Um, so we are getting dangerously close um, and uh, it's pretty scary. So why is it scary? Um, let's talk a little bit about how the increase in carbon dioxide can cause a variety of different climate impacts from flooding for our farmers and for folks out in the West, air quality, um, ozone is a big factor of this, as well as the fires that we've seen out West, fires causing lower air quality as well, and then also heat waves. And Chicago has um, a very close relationship with heat waves. In fact, as many of us probably remember uh, the 1995 heat wave that we experienced in 25 years ago. And um, that was a very tragic moment for our city um, because folks, especially on the south and west sides who were primarily elderly, primarily black, um, didn't have access to cooling stations, um, were afraid to open their windows and cool off and were dying as a result. And many of these people, um, their bodies were stored in cooling facilities in trucks um, because there was the um, city was so overwhelmed by this. So um, unfortunately, we're likely to see more of these tragedies as climate um, change intensifies and intensifies in different ways um, in across the country. So climate change isn't going to be the same in Illinois as it is going to be elsewhere. And that's why climate is a justice issue. There are folks um, in Illinois, for example, who live in communities that are often called environmental justice communities because they, ha they don't have as much access to um, migrate, to access healthy food, to, um, you know, change their, their situation, um, and other folks do. And um, we're going to be seeing a lot more of that, especially in the Great Lakes region, where we have a, much of the fresh water um, in the world. And so folks are going to be flocking here because of our fresh water supply. And we need to be prepared for that. And we need to be mindful that um, this is, folks are, are migrating because they are losing their homes. They're losing their homes on the coast. They're losing their homes due to fire out west. And with that in mind, I think Pope Francis really has an excellent way of framing why we need to uh, think about climate as a justice-based solution. So he says, we are not faced with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather complex crisis that is both social and environmental, one complex crisis. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the underprivileged, and at the same time, protecting nature. He said that in the encyclical, which was um, published in 2015. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's, that's really scary. That's heavy stuff, but there are solutions and there are things that 
we as individuals and as members of larger communities can do to address the, these climate issues. So let's talk a little bit about some climate solutions. One really big change that we can make is reducing our food waste. If, <clears throat> excuse me, so one third of the world's food is wasted and the greenhouse gases required to um, produce that are also wasted. Um, and if food waste were a country, it would be the number three global greenhouse gas emitter, according to the UN. It'd be like its own country. Um, so there's a group called Project Drawdown and they have suggested that if we do things like composting, if we eat less meat and less dairy, then we can considerably reduce our greenhouse gases in this way. Um, and we also have a toolkit offered by Faith in Place, which I think Samantha will be dropping in the chat. And this toolkit, I have to say, I've seen it um, put together. It's a really great piece uh, because it talks about all kinds of waste. And especially for the holiday season, it's really important to be thinking about how are we celebrating our holidays in an ethical way? And how can we reduce the, the food that we're eating and, and consuming and making sure that we're eating what we buy? So I definitely wanna point out the um, holiday appendix that we have at the back of that toolkit. And let's also talk about energy efficiency. I'm excited to pass the mic on in a moment to Akosua because energy efficiency is what Elevate Energy is really, really good at um, educating communities about. Um, and before we get there, let's just note that according to the World Economic Forum, a third of energy in US residences and commercial spaces is wasted. That's a huge amount of energy. And just think about how now that many of us are working from home, um, those spaces that we would commute to, like I would commute to the Chicago office, they're not being used, but they still have to be heated. And so that is a huge amount of waste and much of that energy consumption is also being added on to our homes. So let's pass the mic and talk a little bit more about how we can solve some of these energy efficiency problems. Akosua? Yes, thank you so much, Katie. Um, thanks again, Faith and Place for having me. I um, am Akosua Guzbi, as Katie stated, and um, I work as um, a resource coordinator for Elevate Energy. And Elevate is a nonprofit organization and we've been in the nonprofit space for um, the past 20 years. This is our 20 year anniversary since the, the year 2000. We started off as CNT. Um, like a lot of nonprofits, we are we get our funding from uh, independent sources and then we also get our funded funding from um, government sources. Uh, and one of our biggest funders is ISA, the Illinois um, um, Science and Engineering fund and um, we have been, like I said it before, working in this space for 20 years, but we recently uh, honed in on uh, energy, like Katie said, like we do a lot of energy efficiency work and we have a lot of energy efficiency programs, which I'm really, really excited to talk to you guys about. But we, we've also lately decided that we're gonna, because we've worked, there's so much in environmental justice that we want to address. Um, we didn't want to segment ourselves only in energy. So now we're expanding our, our name. We're, 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 um, we're dropping energy from Elevate and that'll happen in the next year. And we're going to um, broaden our horizons because we also do a lot of work with 
um, like a lot of Illinois Solar for All, and we do work with um, water environmental justice um, reform when it comes to water. Uh, we, we have programs in uh, lead and water programs in Chicago, but we've helped, um, we've helped Illinois and Chicago area specifically identify different um, lead in water uh, that is affecting EJC communities, um, environmental justice communities, um, like Katie was talking about. Um, well, moving forward, what I'm going to talk to you about today, well, I already told you guys kind of like who we are. Um, what I want to talk to to us uh, to you guys today about is um, some of our options when it comes to energy. So the best way for us to um, deal with energy, the energy crisis, the best way to reduce our own carbon footprint when it comes to the amount of energy we use is to know what we're paying for and how much we're paying for energy and where that cost is going. And then once we realize what where, where our money is going, then we can start to cut back in certain areas. Um, and we can not only save the environment, but we can also uh, and reduce our own carbon footprint. But we can also save some money. Um, so when we're talking about energy supplies, a lot of people think that energy is our light. So a lot of people will um, refer to the energy uh, bill as their light bill. Um, but energy is so much more than just lights. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, if you live in in Illinois, you either live in the Comet territory or the Amarin territory, and that's how we split it up. Um, that just means that those two energy companies have a monopoly on energy when it comes to our state. So if you live in Chicago or around Chicago, which everybody on, on this particular Zoom does, if you live in this area, you're, you're getting your energy um, delivered through Comet. But um, recently, in recent years, um, what, what happened is we created legislation that allowed for the market to be opened up. So you don't have to get your energy supplied through ComEd. So you, you're gonna get your energy delivered through ComEd. So your bill is gonna say ComEd, but now you have some options when it comes to your supply. And why is this good? Options are always good. It creates um, competition. And comp when people are competing for your service, then they have to have a competitive price point. So it's allowed ComEd to come in and say, hey, we're gonna be more competitive than our competitors um, and, supply, and offer you things that they can't offer you. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. But basically there are three ways that you can get your energy supplied. So you have the electric utility, that's ComEd, and then you have what we call retail electric suppliers, or what I like to call alternative suppliers. These alternative suppliers, you may have seen, they might have come to your door. They might have a table set up at, at Walmart or at the gym, or maybe even on the street corner, and they're giving out things in order to lure you to their table and ask you some questions about your energy bill. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll tell you that they can save you X amount of money on your energy as compared to ComEd. So if you switch over with us, um, we have more competitive rates and we'll be cheaper. And a lot of times that's true what they say, but what, what we don't realize in the fine print is that um, those electric supply companies will also often have it written in, their, in your contract where after about six months, 12 months, maybe even 18 months, your energy um, rates can double and sometimes quadruple the amount that they were when you first signed up. So all of a sudden you have this astronomical bill and you don't understand why, because we didn't realize that that was something that was going to happen. And then another thing that, um, another thing that, another way, the last and final way that you can get your energy supplied is through um, the municipal aggregation. So that's just if you, um, that's just, so municipal aggregation is just if your town, let's say you live in Oak Park or you live in um, a suburb in the Chicago area. So you you have this this town and in the they all decide for all the residents in the town that we're gonna go with this one electric supply company. They may tell you, they may not tell you that this is happening. It may be good for you, but they've already decided that it's good for the entire town. And that's the, the, the route that we're gonna go in. Um, a lot of times you'll have to talk to your municipal aggregation if you live in one 
able to find out if you have an alternative supplier and then also find out if you can um, get released from that. So then uh, next, what I like to talk about is just to show you an example bill. So a lot of people say, oh, I definitely get my, my energy through comment. I already know that because when my bill comes, it says comment. Well, all of our bills come and say comment. And that's that's the tricky part about it. We They make these bills, so they're kind of difficult to read. I'm kind of still learning myself how to read these bills. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the circuit, the, the highlighted portion in green. That's where you're going to find out if you have an alternative supplier. So it'll say XYZ Energy Service Provider there. And then they'll tell you what your rate is for that company. Um, I like to tell people a story about how uh, somebody came to my door, a, 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 a pair of younger adults came to my door around dinner time. I don't even know how they got into my building because I lived in an apartment and told me they needed to see my bill and they could save me money. And I, I was very busy. I didn't really have time to really investigate what they were saying, but I ended up signing up for something that I had no idea what I was signing up for. And a few months later, my bill was over $400 and I lived in an apartment. And I didn't understand why. And at the time, my sister worked at CUB, which is the Citizens Utility Board. So that is where I like to direct people sometimes is to the Citizens Utility Board, where they can, um, they can, they are a watchdog organization, they're a nonprofit. And what they do is they make sure that you're not getting swindled by these companies, which sometimes can be the case. But I ended up calling my sister at CUB and she got me, um, she, I gave her my bill and she took it to the office and they found out that I had signed up for the alternative supplier and they <clears throat> called on my behalf and got me out of that contract. Ended up getting into another contract later, but that just goes to show you how aggressive the um, alternative suppliers can be, how you can get into one, get out of one, and then get right back into one because they're literally everywhere. So what I like to say is about nine times out of 10, it's probably best to just stay with comment. So <clears throat> moving on, you see this, this, um, this bill, um, there is a reason that I like to draw people's attention to as to why we're able to see these advancements in energy. And one of those are the upgrades that have been made with our grid. And so what well, I like to call it the old grid and the new grid. And so just to distinguish the old grid is what you see in this picture, let's say the bottom left corner um, you have the technicians on the lines and they're more or less um, behind you in, the, in your um, alleyway. You'll see the lines and the poles and people working on them, seems like all the time. Um, and then what you have in the upper right corner is just all the lights that we don't even realize are running on, in the United States at all times using stressing up this grid that we had. And what a lot of people didn't realize is that our grid was the same grid back from the time of Edison when energy was quote unquote discovered, okay? So we still had the same grid, the same grid system that we've always had. And so what was done, I think you can move to the next slide. It's just another graphic, yeah. So what we've done is we've made it a lot smarter. So our phones have gotten smarter. Our lighting has gotten smarter. Our cars have gotten smarter. So it only made sense that our grid would get smarter. So actually I like the history of it is pretty cool. Um, the Illinois Institute of Technology, you might know they're right there on the South side on 35th street. They had come up with the technology to put this, put um, electricity grids underground. And so um, um, that grid ended up getting studied and they used that grid in the entirety of um, Illinois. So now the majority of our, we still get electricity from those lines in the back, but the majority of our electricity is coming from underground and what we call the smart grid, if you can move forward now. And so this is just a little graphic. The, the next few slides are just graphics because I like to just, I'm a visual learner and I, I like to see what I'm talking about. And so um, you can see that the old grid, like I said, was from the time of Edison and then you see on the on the left hand side, it still looks almost identical. And even though this is the modern world, we were still living with wires everywhere. Um, and we didn't even really think about it. I'd never think about where my electricity is coming from. I never think, but but I do enjoy the benefits of the smart grid. And I'm gonna pre present to you a few of those benefits so you just understand 
why it's so important that we, we now have this smart grid. So because we have the smart grid, um, there's now a two-way communication system between our homes and the electricity company. Why is that important? It just makes it easier for us to get an exact reading on how much our energy is, how much we're paying for energy and how much energy we're using. So because of ISA, because of the smart grid, we all now have these. This is a, um, a smart meter. So everybody's home is equipped with a smart meter. I don't know, the old meter looks very, kind of similar to this meter, but it doesn't have a digital reader. So this meter has a digital reader. And so what happens is comment no longer has to come to your house and read your meter. There used to be people who were paid to come out, they were called meter readers. And if we're old enough, we remember those meter readers. What was the problem with meter readers? A lot of times we would have estimated billing because we have meter readers. So those, so they would have to guess how much energy we were, be, we were using every month. And so then they would say, well, I think we should charge you $200. And then later on that month, they would say, well, you didn't use that much energy, so we'll give you a credit to your account. So what was happening is we were being overcharged for energy just because they didn't have enough people to come out and look at our home. Why else is it important? Because it was dangerous too. So we had these things called blackouts. And I don't know, in a lot of movies, they, they depict blackouts. I don't know, one of my favorite movies is Spike Lee's Brooklyn. And there's this long scene where the entire neighborhood in Brooklyn is without lights and everybody's got candles. And we used, to, we used to always have candles and flashlights in my house, just in case we had a blackout. We didn't know how long we were gonna be in the, the dark. You could be in the dark for a day, two days, three days, a week, you didn't know. And that's because somebody literally had to come from the electricity, the electric company and look through the entire neighborhood and find the down wire in the alley which was live, mind you. So if there are children playing or if it landed in water, it could be very, very dangerous to be around that type of loose energy. So we don't have to worry about that with the smart grid. So that's another thing that the smart grid has afforded us. But this is what you came here for. You really wanna know how you can save money because of the smart grid. And the way you can save money through the smart grid is through a few um, pricing programs that ComEd is able to put in place because they have this smart grid available to them. So one of them is peak time savings rewards and the other one is power smart um, and or slash hourly pricing. Um, and I think in the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about those. So this is um, hourly pricing. So what I like to tell people to do is, well, you can literally just go Google comment hourly pricing and what will come up is in high, it'll be highlighted underneath the, the first the first listing, it'll say a chart. If you click on chart, it'll bring you to this grid that you see on, on the screen right now. This is from November 5th, but if you go on there right now, you will see how much energy costs today, November 16th. And you can do that every day. Why is that important? You can literally time your energy usage based on the time of day. So typically, um, ComEd will charge you a fixed rate and it's around six pence cents per kilowatt hour. So you're charged six cents per kilowatt hour, which is like, okay, great, that, that's fine. We're all being charged that. However, what a lot of people don't know is that the price of energy fluctuates throughout the day. And what a lot of people really don't realize is it rarely, if ever, goes up to six cents or over six cents. So really they're charging you six cents to, accom to accommodate those who are using an exorbitant amount of energy, they're the only people who really benefit from paying six cents per kilowatt hour on a fixed rate. The rest of us who are more energy conscious, who are more concerned with the environment, who want to save money, we can get on what we call hourly pricing. And the red line you'll see is how much energy costs at that time of day. So when this was pulled, it was pulled on November 5th around 10 a.m. and energy was not even five cents per kilowatt hour. But what's really cool is the blue line. The blue line shows us how much energy is gonna cost, projected to cost, I should say, for the following day. So we can literally plan out our days. So what I do is I get up in the morning and I, I um, may run a load of, of laundry in the morning because um, when I get up at 6 a.m., energy is one cents per kilowatt hour. So I'll run a load of laundry. I won't run any laundry past 10 a.m. 
So I'll just do one, maybe two loads if I can. Then and the evening time when energy goes down again, the price of energy goes down again, I will load my dishwasher and I'll let my dishwasher run overnight and then I'll unload it in the morning. So if you use your energy that way, because that, that's just an example because those are two appliances that we use a lot of energy in our homes. We use our energy that way, we end up saving money over the long run. However, there are some risks involved with this program. So we always tell people before you sign up for this program, it's important to call um, Elevate Energy. We have a hotline with dedicated um, uh, people who will answer these lines specifically to answer pricing program questions and to let you know if you are a good candidate for hourly pricing. But nine times out of 10, unless you run a home daycare where you have to wash laundry all day and you have to do different things, all you have to run up large appliances all day, um, where you have to sit in the AC all day um, or you have to sit in the, the heat all day, that might be advantageous for you to not be on hourly pricing. But for the most part, hourly pricing is for almost everybody and it's free to get on and free to get off. The next program is peak time savings. Peak time savings um, is a program that you can really take advantage of in the summer months. Because what happens is, um, as the name suggests, you can save money during peak times. And remember the peak times are in the middle of the day when most people are either lounging at home or taking it easy during work hours. You're not, you know, you're working from your computer so you're sitting kind of still or you in the olden days, you were out at a, at a job somewhere. So you weren't running energy in your home. So during those times, especially in the summertime, um, what will happen is we have what we call peaker plants. And though that's where um, that's where our reserve energy comes from. So on those really hot days, let's say when it's going to be in the 90s and 100 degree weather, um, we might have to tap into that reserve energy, and that's going to put stress on the grid. And that stress on the grid is going to cause uh, that that chart that I showed you earlier. It's going to cause that chart to spike up, and for us to be spending a little more money on our energy. But it's usually during those hours when we're not, we're really kind of chilling. What I like to do during peak time, if there's a peak time day, it's a day where it's going to be hot, the grid is going to be stressed, and ComEd gives me a call and says, hey, because you're on our peak time savings program, you, if you reduce your energy between the hours of 1 and 7 p.m. today, you will see a savings on your bill. I will go to a cafe and work there. I will go use somebody else's energy so that I can keep my energy low and save money. The last time I I took advantage of the peak time savings rewards program. I saved $20 on my bill. So peak time hourly pricing, you might want to check. But peak time savings rewards is for everybody. It's free to get on, free to get off. I suggest you do it immediately. You can do it from your computer. Just Google it and sign up. Okay. I think I'm off my soapbox on that. So now I want to talk to you about the fun stuff, which is how we can save energy in our homes. Um, so what... First, we're going to do a poll. I mean, Katie's going to run us through this poll. And um, we want to know if you would be interested in either of those pricing programs. And then we want to know, because we're moving on to the next part of my little program, we want to know where does your home, where do you believe your home loses the most energy? And you have to fill out both questions. Yes, please fill out both questions if you don't mind. Almost there. Waiting on one more person. Is it me? Or I'm, I'm, I didn't, let me vote. Um, I have a question. Oh, I can't. Yes? Um, so you said the peak time savings, you, you say you can uh, sign up for it on the website? Uh-huh. And so I just need my account number, right? Yes, but you can't, even if you don't know your um, your account number, what you can do is um, put in your phone number um, or uh, you can put in your phone number and they'll be able to look up your account. So you don't even need to like find your last bill to, to get that information. They have it for you on file. 
Oh, cool. So, thanks for asking. And, and you can be on both of them at the same time, right? You don't have to pick one or the yes, other. Yes, you don't have to pick one or the other. You can be on both pricing programs. They're both free to get on, free to get off. So we're going to move on. Thank you so much for, for participating in the poll. It looks like some people said windows and some people say attic and basement. And attic and basement is actually the answer. So thank you. Um, it's the answer, but a lot of times people say windows and walls. But let me tell you why people think it's their windows and walls that um, that they're losing the most energy from. Because when you put your hands up to the window, you kind of feel the air coming through. You it feels like it's leaking through. Or if you get too close to the to the door, you can feel the air leaking from the bottom, and so it's kind of drafty in those areas. And so you don't want to be close to there during the winter months. And then the windows are extremely hot during the the summer months, so it feels like they're just sucking up all, all the heat from the outside and making your house exorbitantly hot. But it's really the attics and the basement. And the solution is very simple, it's air sealing and insulation. So when you think about how much it would cost for you to, to, to redo all your windows, for instance, that could be thousands of dollars. That's wasted because you only lose 10% of your energy through your windows. So you're, you're not addressing the root issue. That's basically what I wanna say. And in this like cute little graphic, it just shows you how air flows, like how air in the summer is coming in because heat rises, it's coming in through your attic, it's hitting that AC cooling system real hard, telling your home that it's extremely hot in there. And so then in the bottom portion of the home, it's so cold because that AC is running, it's running uh, way more than it needs to. So it's keeping your the, the main living areas of your home super chilly. And the opposite is happening in the winter months. Cold air is coming in through the, the through the basement, through those leaks and your foundation and your furnace is, is telling your furnace that your home is extremely cold. And this your furnace is heating up your home, your living areas, exorbitant an exorbitant amount. And then most of that heat is just rising up. And because your insulation is poor in your attic, it's just escaping your home. So you are just heating the neighborhood. You're not even heating your house. Okay. Next slide. This is this graphic is is similar, but I like to show this one because you can actually see the appliances. You see the culprits. You see how air come is coming through those little holes in your dryer vent in your basement. Um, there's an outdoor faucet on the side of your home that might have some holes and cracks in it where air can escape. Um, there, if you can see, if you look closely enough at the in the attic, you can see that the insulation level is not properly where it needs to be. It doesn't hit all the way to the ceiling. So the heat is escaping out of there. And these are just some common areas where air escapes your home. Um, and then this, this, this image is very, very telling of where those areas are. Um, so what we like to do is say that what you need to do is protect the envelope of your home. So your home has an envelope. And I like to tell a quick anecdote because I like anecdotes. Uh, when I went off to visit colleges many, many moons ago, I had this class ring that I loved. I got my high school class ring. It was my birthstone. I had a few diamonds in it. And I was still paying it off because it was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I left it, at, the, I left it at, the, at this girl's dorm. And I asked her to mail it to me. And she mailed it to me in a regular mail. I, I, I wish I had a piece of mail, you know, like a regular envelope. And what I received in the mail was an envelope with a ring size hole in it. Somebody has stolen my class ring and there was nothing I could do about it. I, I didn't have insurance on it. It was, it was very, it's very sad, but it's just, it's very telling that it's how you envelop something. It makes all the difference. You do not want things escaping out of your envelope. So you think of your home as the, the walls and the basement and the attic, all of that stuff is the envelope of your home and we have to secure it. Next slide. So here is some ways, this is the fun part that I was alluding to before. Here are the fun ways that we can DIY our own envelope. So we could take care of our home ourselves. It is a pandemic out there. We don't want to spend too much time outside going out. We don't want people in our homes. So in, in simpler times, we could send somebody out to do an energy assessment of your home, but things have changed. So what I want to do is I want to empower you with information on how 
you can make changes in your own home that will save you money and that will reduce your energy um, footprint. So ways to manage your heating and cooling costs, check your furnace filter every 30 to 45 days. A dirty filter can reduce airflow by as much as 35%. It's super duper easy to do on your own. My, um, uh, my thermostat has been saying change filter for like a month now, but I'm gonna get to it. I'm gonna do it myself. And then I'm gonna report back and I'm gonna let you know how easy it was to do on your own. I was gonna call somebody, but I'm gonna do it myself because this is my job to tell people that they can do it themselves. You can do it yourself. Next slide. So your duct work. Okay, so like there's, there can be cracks in your duct work and all you have to do is grab some of that cheap little insulation at Lowe's and wrap that around your duct thing and then tape it up real good. Make sure you secure your face with a mask and wear some gloves. You can do that on your own. I know it seems, it seems daunting, but that little bit can really help. Insulating your um, unconditioned areas really helps. Next. Also, you can get some caulk for a few dollars at the, at um, the, I keep saying Lowe's. I'm like, what kind of, is that a hardware store? Is it a home improvement store. You can go to the home improvement store. You can, and then what you want to do is you want to caulk your door frames, your window frames, your baseboard trim, your crown mold, and just go across your entire home. This is the time, guys. I know it's already cold in Chicago, but this is the time to start really working on it before it gets really, really cold. And we can go to the next slide. And this is just a, a close up of what that looks like. Then you can see in the first picture how where that crack is, and then the second picture where he's just sliding through with that caulk. Next slide. You can do the out the same thing with the inside, the outside of your windows. Install storm windows, caulk, and weather strip is necessary. You can get that from the home improvement store, and you can um, repair cracks um, on the damaged glaze with the with the caulking and. You can manage existing window coverings. I know that we will use that e-film. We used to do that in my house. It made a big difference, you know, putting that little film over the windows and using the blow dryer to tighten it up. That that really helps your home not feel drafty and be more comfortable. Next. And then you can do spray foam. So spray foam was really cool. Um, you If you see a hole, a lot of times when um, when people come and do work on your home, what they'll do is they'll leave um, big gaping holes and you might not even know I have a big gaping hole underneath my sink that was left there and the only solution is for me to get some spray foam and seal it seal it myself seal around those pipes because they always cut a hole that's too big and they don't they don't seal it for you you want to go in and go and and do that sealing on your own um, next slide this one I, I I advocated for it to stay in because I think it's really cool a lot of people don't know that um, your electrical sockets, they um, are a big leak of, of, of your air. So what you wanna do is get a couple of cents, couple of pennies, and you can get a few of these foam gaskets, take that cover off with a screwdriver, put that foam gasket on, and then put the cover back on and it'll do a great job of insulating your outlet. Um, this is another, another um, slide that I like because it's about water waste. So uh, what, what a lot of people may not know is that our toilet is the number one consumption of water in our home. And we are flushing down gallons and gallons of water every time we flush the toilet. So in my house, we have a, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down rule. And we, I am a stickler for that rule because I do not like waste and I do not like water waste. You go in. You can also find out if you have a silent toilet leak. And it's really easy. You just take a little cheap food coloring, you put it in the top of the, the toilet basin, flush the toilet, wait a few minutes. If there's food color around the, the outside edge of your toilet on the floor, you have a silent leak. Go ahead and cough around your toilet. Next slide. Um, there's some more ways you can save water on the in, indoors. Keep your showers to five minutes. Um, use only a little bit of water in your bathtub if you're taking a, a bath. Flush the toilet only when necessary. That's what we talked about. Um, don't use it as a garbage can. Don't throw out everything um, but the kitchen sink in your in your toilet. Uh, turn your water faucets off very tightly. Run the dishwasher only when it's full. Run the, run the washing machine only um, when it's full. Next slide. Okay, he's going to talk about climate change. Let's see, Yeah. 
Thank you. This is great. Um, I'm learning so much from all of these energy efficiency tips and I definitely have some questions. If you have questions too, please uh, feel free to drop them in the chat um, and we will try to answer them. Um, so I'm gonna talk for a minute about the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which is a really important bill that has been uh, presented to the Illinois State House, the General Assembly, several times now. We're actually like over 400 days since it was first introduced at the end of 2019. Um, and this is the only clean energy bill that has been presented that um, listened to community members. It went, um, let me backtrack for a second. So the Faith in Place and Elevate Energy and lots of other organizations are part of an um, organization called the Illinois Clean Jobs, um, uh, <laughs> I'm blanking, Coalition, thank you. Yeah, Coalition. And together, we have gone around the state, we've hosted listening sessions to hear what people want out of clean energy. Um, you might know that back in 2016, the Clean Energy Jobs Coalition was able to pass the Future Energy Jobs Act, which was hugely important for climate energy um, and for centering justice in terms of jobs. It's led to the solar energy boom that we've had in the state in these last four years. But with the pandemic and with money running out from the Future Energy Jobs Act, we're facing a solar energy cliff. And people who have been um, part of this industry and it's seen its explosion and are depending on those jobs, thousands of people have already lost their jobs in the last few months, um, which is horrible. Um, and yet there is a fix and there are lots of fixes in the Clean Energy Jobs Act um, because it really stands on several pillars. Um, and throughout these pillars, there's a focus on equity. There's a focus on getting toward clean energy um, as soon as possible. And we know that there are people like the governor who support clean energy transition. So it's really a matter of getting it over the finish line. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what these pillars are. So pillar one is promoting jobs, equity, and economic opportunity, especially in communities of color. So what does this look like? This looks like um, job hubs that Faith in Place is a part of, where we help to train communities, um, especially individuals who are returning from the incarceration system and individuals who are coming out of the foster care system to access training and access jobs. We also have a pillar about uh, ensuring Illinois reaches 100% renewable energy by 2050. And this does include um, uh, nuclear for a time, but we really do want to move beyond that by 2050. And then our third pillar is reducing the pollution equivalent of 1 million gasoline and diesel powered vehicles from the road. And this is especially important, not just for the Chicagoland area, which has, a, you know, the CTA, it has the PACE system as well out in the suburbs. Um, but this is also for communities that um, might need better access to Amtrak or might have um, a bus system as well, you know, getting these, um, creating more access to um, energy efficiency and EV vehicles, especially, so that people like myself included can purchase an EV car. You know, last year I was looking at purchasing a vehicle and I live in an apartment in Chicago and I really wanted to buy an EV, but it was just not practical um, because I don't have a garage where I can set up a charging station. You know, I park my car on the street and I would be looking to 
um, go to basically like a gas station to access an EV charging um, situation. But that isn't um, where it needs to be. And there are provisions in CJA to expand that as well. And then our last pillar is achieving a carbon free power sector by 2030 to create jobs and communities abandoned by coal burning companies. So this is where we would be moving away from nuclear energy, but it's also how we would be um, ensuring that communities who are um, either dependent on coal um, as the primary source of income for their community or um, communities that have many of the same communities that have been polluted and harmed like Waukegan um, by these coal fired power plants um, and coal uh, mines that they have job opportunities and that they're not just left behind in this clean energy transition. And that's really, really important to Faith in Place and to the um, Clean Jobs Coalition because we know that for too long, the polluters have just gotten away with um, harming communities and with leaving their messes for the community to pick up. And that's just not okay. So one of the things that we wanna continue funding through the Clean Energy Jobs Act is the Illinois Solar for All program. This got started in the Future Energy Jobs Act and has been an amazing opportunity for communities to that are low income to access solar for their homes. Um, basically, it is a way for a homeowner like the homeowner that is pictured here to get solar panels um, at cost or completely free if possible. Um, and it's been just amazing to watch this happen. This picture, in, in fact, was taken at an installation that happened earlier this summer and Pastor Anque, our policy director, was able to go out and watch these solar panels be put on the roof. Um, and the homeowner was just absolutely elated. So I think we're gonna watch a video next that talks a little bit more about the Solar for All program. And please let me know if you can't hear. At Faith in Place, we empower people of faith to fight climate change but addressing the problem is not enough. We want to solve it in a way that prioritizes those most affected by climate change's impacts. We want climate justice. That is why we support the Illinois Solar for All program. Traditionally, solar energy is only available for wealthier communities. Illinois Solar for All is designed to give low wealth communities access to solar energy through incentives that make solar installations affordable and keep electric bills down. The program is designed to serve people historically left out of the solar market, low to moderate income households, people of color, and residents of environmental justice communities which are most impacted by pollution from fossil fuels. A quarter of the program's funds are reserved for projects located in these communities. Illinois Solar for All also trains citizens returning from the justice system or leaving foster care to be solar installers, and then incentivizes solar contractors to hire this new workforce. Access to a solar career can make the difference for someone returning from prison. These jobs provide resources that help build a just economy while increasing resilience to climate change for communities. Learn more about Solar for All and other just climate solutions by reaching out to Faith in Place. At Faith in... All right. So we're going to take a little poll. This will be our last poll. Thank you all for contributing throughout the uh, webinar. Um, this poll is asking if you're interested in learning more about Solar for All. So I'll go ahead and launch that. And while you all are responding to that poll, we did get a question from Kayla in the chat. Um, Kayla says, can you all share some more energy tips for places of worship and churches? 
That's a great question. And I definitely want to say that Faith in Place is really focused on helping houses of worship um, become more energy efficient. And the way that we do that is for one, we meet with you and we will set up a free energy audit, which is a really exciting opportunity um, to have some very smart people come out and look at your house of worship building. We know that houses of worship um, often are, you know, they take up a lot of energy. Um, and like Akusa was talking about earlier, the um, there's a lot of opportunity in a house of worship that uh, to reduce those um, energy costs by um, looking at insulation, looking at um, even your furnace. We have a financing program where we can really help you uh, finance some bigger projects as well. And um, that's exciting because we know that for retrofitting a house of worship, that's often a really expensive venture. And I think Samantha would be more than happy to follow up with you about um, further questions that you might have about energy efficiency and scheduling one of those um, uh, meetings. All right, so let's see. And the poll. And we have someone interested. Awesome. That's great. All righty. So we are just about done. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, we've really appreciated being with you today. We just want to summarize a little bit about what we talked about because we talked about a lot of different ways that you can take action. You can take action by reducing food waste, both as an individual and thinking about this as a house of worship. Um, when you do come back together as a community, what kinds of events are you hosting? How are you hosting them? Those are the kinds of questions that you can ask yourself and look more into um, with our food, um, with our waste toolkit. And you can also do that with the energy audit that I was ta just talking about. You know, one of the biggest things with um, starting with an energy audit is you can really find many of those small changes that don't cost a lot of money um, to do first. Many people will think, oh, I have to start off by doing solar. Mm -hmm. And we often will say, hold on, solar is very expensive. Geothermal is very expensive. They can be fantastic options, but let's try to find you savings first that will be more bang for your buck and cost less initially. You can also start a green team. We have an amazing group of people, including Samantha, who are coaches to hundreds of green teams across the state and are really amazing at um, encouraging people to, to do that um, and to figure out what their goals are. You can also sign up for one of the smart energy programs that we talked about, hourly pricing, peak time savings, and we would love if you would sign our petition to get CJA passed as soon as possible. Um, we need as much support as possible. And the last thing is to watch out for community solar. Do you want to say anything about that, Akosua? Just that I love community solar. It's <laughs> going to be awesome. It's going to be available for communities that are, like you said, historically left out of um, joining a, a clean energy source. So we're, we're excited about community solar for sure. Absolutely. I'm excited too, because it means that people can get solar energy, can get a renewable resource for their energy without having to invest in um, a very expensive system mm -hmm. uh, that may not be accessible to them for a variety of reasons, whether it's um, because of your income or because you're a renter or many other reasons. Yeah, for sure. 
So let's just take a quick moment. What are some ways that you wanna take action on climate change? Feel free to put those in the chat. I definitely want to explore some more about um, the gaskets. I wanted to ask too, are the, is that something with, um, that I would like need to shut the energy off first before I put those gaskets around my sockets? I don't want to get that shut. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, no, no. You could just um, unscrew the, the cap uh, just make sure nothing's plugged into the, the energy source. And then you could just, you know, put it on there. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess I, I did want to share that um, um, what we do, do these workshops like periodically, but we also mm -hmm. do um, personal workshops. And when we do those personal workshops, I do um, give away this a Nest thermostat and these are um, these are uh, programmable by your your mobile device by your phone, um, so you can really make sure that you are reducing your energy and saving on your energy by um, programming your 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 thermostat by your phone. So you you're never at home or not at home, I should say, when your energy is running. So I do give these away for anyone working uh, or wanting to get in touch with, with me. Um, we do this virtually, obviously. I do the same <laughs> virtual conversation. That's awesome and great, great to know. Maybe yeah. we can do a little bit of a raffle for the folks yeah. who were on this call. Um, That'd be we will awesome. definitely be sending out the recording and all of the links. We know that we had lots of links to share with you all today. Um, mm -hmm. And those will be available in our follow-up email. And we will be putting this on the um, Faith in Place YouTube account as well. So we hope that you'll give us a follow, um, give Elevate Energy a follow, Thanks, Samantha, for putting those links in the chat. We do have two very important surveys that we would love for you to fill out um, to help us um, understand your interest in Illinois Solar for All. So much like Elevate, Faith in Place also has some ways to connect with us. Social media is especially one of them. You can find out about events that we're hosting through our social media. You can register for those events on our website, faithinplace.org. And you can also email us. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to get you connected with the coach in your region. We're happy to uh, get you connected with some of the programs that we talked about today. Um, so yeah. With that, I wanna give a big thank you to everyone who's able to join us and um, let Samantha and Akosua also sign off. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.